Good morning to everybody. Good to have you here. We're in 2 Kings. We're ready for chapter 18, which begins with Hezekiah. I'm going to remind you again, especially in these last two weeks, that you need to read ahead. And next week, you need to read all the way to the end, because we're, Lord willing, we're going to be done by, by uh, next week. So uh, Assyria repopulated Israel with people from Babylon on the Euphrates. Oh, excuse me, skip down to Hezekiah's restoration. I apologize. Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem as a righteous king, removing the pagan high places, breaking their images. He also broke uh, the bronze serpent that Moses made, which I believe they called Nehushtan. And uh, they, they, they'll worship anything. Uh, anything uh, seemed like almost except God. Uh, and that's what happened then. Uh, Second Chronicles tells us he called on the Levites to sanctify themselves and cleanse the temple. Uh, there were sin offerings that were made for all of Israel, and the services in the Lord's house were set in order. Hezekiah sent letters to all Judah and Israel uh, to keep the Passover. While many scorned, some responded. I want you to particularly notice that. By this time, remember, Israel is is gone into captivity, but the people still living in the land, he invites to come to this Passover. So that's an interesting move on, on his part. Uh, the Lord accepted the nation's true repentance. Uh, the people kept the feast for seven days beyond the norm, uh, and that was simply for joy. They were so excited about uh, serving God, so joyful about that. Uh, Hezekiah restored the law for offerings, and there was a great abundance that was, uh, was given. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. Please look at your, at your Bibles. If you underline, watch, watch this interesting thing that happens. Verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Now skip down to verse uh, verse 19. And here we're looking at the words of the Rabbi Shaka. And he's going to make fun of that concept as he uses the, at the end, what confidence is this in which you trust? That's in verse 19, verse 20. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Verse 21, you're trusting in the staff of the broken reed, Egypt. And at the bottom he says... So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust him. It's the same word every time so far. Look at verse 22. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God. Watch him right there. He crossed a line right there that he's going to pay for. Because he's, he's making fun of trusting in God. And that's going to be a mistake. But anyway, that's what he did. Verse 24. Uh, <clears throat> least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt. There's a word again, trust. Uh, skip on down to verse 30, uh, because in verse, uh, in verse 30, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. There he goes again, making fun of God. Just keep that in mind. Chapter 19, verse uh, 10, and we'll, we'll find... Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you. Oh, he is, he is crossing a huge line. That's the words of the Rabshakeh again that we're looking at in that particular place. Now I'm going to pick up on a different word in just a few minutes. And it's going to be interesting uh, how God uses uh, that uh, because uh, you, he's... You'll notice Rabshakeh makes, makes fun of God, not just in the idea of trusting Him, but also in the idea of deliverance. And we'll look more at that as we go on through. Uh, because Hezekiah trusted God, he kept his commandments, and the Lord caused him to prosper. And that's always been the case, still is now. Hezekiah also proved himself mighty in war by throwing off the Assyrian yoke. Uh, in 705 and humiliating the Philistines. Early in his reign, uh, Israel fell under the domination of Assyria because they did not obey the Lord's voice. Critical to notice that in the text. Why was Israel ever punished by the Lord? Always the same. Because they didn't obey his voice. 
Didn't do what he said. Very important to see that. Hezekiah briefly panicked as Sennacherib took some cities and asked for 300 talents of gold, which is equal to $5 billion today. You want me to not come? Give me $5 billion. And I won't come. Well, I'll tell you, I'll not come for a whole lot less. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of money that we're talking about. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> to pay it, Hezekiah raided his personal bank account, not to mention the temple. And in humiliation, he was even forced to scrape the gold from the temple doors and doorposts. Now, I bring all that up. It's in the text, of course. But I want us to see Hezekiah is a great faithful man, but right here he slips. Okay? Why do I want to emphasize that? Because I slip. You know, sometimes we think, well, that means I can't be faithful to God. No, it, it means you need to come back. You need to change. I'll grant you that. But it doesn't mean you can't be faithful. Just one slip does not, does not destroy an entire life if you don't let it. Because God's willing to take you back. Uh, but such an immense ransom, which we've just seen, wasn't good enough. Uh, the king of Assyria uh, wanted to make Hezekiah pay because Hezekiah had led a rebellious group of kings against him, and he was apparently going to make him pay the price. He had three different titles are mentioned here. His tartan was his commander-in-chief, the highest official in the empire, outside the king, of course. The Rabsaris is the chief eunuch, and the Rabshaka is the chief cupbearer. They're sent to lay Jerusalem under siege and demand unconditional surrender. The Rabshaka says Hezekiah's trust in Egypt, his God, or his armies is misplaced and will fail even saying God sent him. Read the text. He claims, you know, your God sent me here uh, to deal with you. And uh, again, he keeps mocking God, and that's going to cost him uh, quite dearly before it's over with. Uh, he calls Sennacherib the great king in verse 19 and also in verse 28. That is a name that is most often used for God. Now, not exclusively, I'll admit that, but, but most often for God. And I demonstrate that with a few verses from Psalms and then Malachi. Rabshakeh, as an envoy of Assyria, breached all the rules of acceptable diplomacy. What did he do? He, he talked to them in the language of the people. And the emissaries, there were three emissaries are, uh, representing uh, Hezekiah. And they said, hey, it's okay. You can speak in your language. We know it. And, of course, Rabshakeh, in violation of, the, of basically the principles that everybody followed in those days, no laws, just, that's just the principles of war, uh, he, say, he basically said, look, I'm going to keep talking because the fellows on that wall are the ones that are going to have to uh, drink their own urine. And I'm trying to be kind, but that's, that's effectively uh, what, what he says. Uh, with all his power and eloquence, Rabshakeh could not elicit the desired response from the people. They knew Hezekiah was a good and God-fearing king, and they commendably left their fate in his hands. All right, quickly, I want you to notice a different word now in the speech of the Rabshakeh. We're going to pick up at verse uh, 29 of chapter 18. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to, watch it, deliver you from his hand. Verse 30, Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. There comes our word again, and notice he's making fun of God again, and then skip on down. Verse 32, where he said, but do not listen, this is the end of the verse, do not listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Verse 33, has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land from the hand of the king of Syria? See what he's doing, he's comparing God Almighty with the, God, the false gods of all these nations he defeated. 
And he keeps using that word deliver. Uh, where are the gods, uh, this verse 34, where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharaim and, and Hena and Iva? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? And who among all the gods of lands have delivered their country? So I'd skip on down. Uh, now it's the letter that he wrote. And notice the end of verse 11 where he says, uh, destroying them, and shall you be delivered? Verse 12, have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed? Now, skip to chapter 20. I don't do this very often, but listen to God's answer. This is verse 6 of chapter 20. This is God's answer through the prophet Isaiah. And I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you. Do you want, you want to test me, Ravshaka? I'm going to show you who I am. That's the message. So two key words in, these, in this chapter, trust and delivered. Uh, very, very, very important uh, words. Well, Hezekiah grieved heavily. He went to the temple. He also sent a delegation of uh, VIPs to inquire of the Lord through Isaiah. Uh, they have a bizarre proverb. We're not used to it, uh, really, but it talks about a woman reaching the time of birth and she can't deliver. Uh, and the idea that there is that, uh, that uh, they are hearing or they're telling God, we don't have the strength to do this. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what God wants them to understand. You want to be delivered? Trust in me. Don't trust in you. That's a very, very important point, uh, I think. Isaiah informs the king's messengers that God is going to teach Rabshakeh a lesson by causing him to react to a rumor and head home and die. And of course, the king is, is really the one ultimately that's directed to. Sennacherib continued his drive toward Egypt, but learned that King uh, Terhaka of Ethiopia was marching his armies to oppose his advance. This new foe made Judah an even more important conquest. Sennacherib did not need an enemy at his back while he engaged the powerful Terhaka, uh, so he dispatched other emissaries to encourage Hezekiah's capitulation. The essence of their threat was the same as the one delivered before. In other words, the letter and the speech match. You know, pretty well. And what do they emphasize? Don't trust God. Don't trust any nations like Egypt. Don't trust your army. None of those will deliver you because no God's ever delivered anybody before. And they're not going to start now. We're going to beat you. Just surrender. That's, that's what they're looking for. Just surrender. Well, it's, it's interesting then to watch uh, Hezekiah's response uh, to that, and uh, as as he is given that message uh, from them, he goes to uh, to the temple and spreads the letter in front of God. And I want to read that with you. It's really pretty pretty powerful. Beginning in verse fourteen of uh, chapter nineteen, and Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. So what does he start with? You're the creator. How powerful are you? You're the creator. And I recognize that. Uh, <clears throat> Now, how does this contrast with what the Rav Shaka has said? Well, a lot. Uh, because there's no God able to defeat me, uh, defeat me, that is the Rav Shaka, or the armies of Assyria. Uh, Hezekiah doesn't view it that way. Verse 16, Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. You see the emphasis this is the same emphasis you got from Elijah when he stood on Mount Carmel. We're looking at, back to what, about 1 Kings chapter 18? When he, when he said what? 
I'm asking you to do this, in, this t- in that case, to consume this sacrifice by fire, to prove you are who you are. What's Hezekiah doing? Same thing. Same thing. Let's highlight the fact that God, you are God. You are the only one who can do this. I'm asking you to listen to me. So verse 17, Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the works of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, that's interesting. In the prayer, does he acknowledges that Assyria is a powerful nation. He acknowledges that they've got a, a powerful army. He acknowledges they defeated other people. But notice what else he says. Their gods were not gods. See, so see, what's he still highlighting? There's a difference here. There's a difference between those false gods uh, that the Rabshakeh and and the Assyrians had defeated before, and you, God, because you're a real God. They're not going to throw you in the fire, is kind of the idea that is there. Verse 19, Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from His hand, that all the kings of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. Now, I realize the word save and the word deliver are not exactly the same word, but they mean the same thing. You know, he says nobody can deliver, I, and Hezekiah is basically saying, I know you can. You're the creator. You're, in, you're over all the earth, and you can do this. Now, he doesn't say you must do it. He's very humble in this approach. Now, <clears throat> before we go any further, brethren, we're going to get to something, Lord willing, before this class is over, that's going to sound like Hezekiah is a little bit uh, flippant in his attitude about what's going to happen. You need to put that in chronological context. Hezekiah's illness occurred before this. And you, you need to really read that, because if you don't read it, uh, if you're like me, you're going to misunderstand it. I misunderstood it. But after I read the, and, and realized the chronological time frame, and I realized that, that when he gets sick, it's in the middle of all this with Sennacherib. It's, it's actually before the letter comes. And so d- does he... Humble himself. I think when we read it in just a moment, we're going to say, well, yeah, actually he did. It's just we didn't read it that way. Uh, I didn't read it that way. So uh, you, you may be better than me. And that's okay. You may be sharper than I was. That's okay, too. Uh, I, I, I've, been, I've been in classes where there were people sharper than me. It's okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just a, a poor old country boy trying to read this text and understand it. That's all I'm trying to do. All right. So that's the prayer that he offers at this particular time. And what, what, does, uh, what happens then? Uh, <clears throat> well, then Hez- Isaiah, uh, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel. So now he's going to tell what, what that is. And, and here it is. God is going to teach Rabshakeh a lesson, causing him to hear, react to a rumor head home, and die. So, Sennacherib continued his drive toward Egypt, but he learned that King Terhaka of Ethiopia is marching his army. So here he, he's going to have to go back, go, going to have to turn and fight them at that particular time. Jehovah, by contrast, is the almighty sovereign of the earth. Hezekiah calls on him. Notice, not on the basis of merit. Did you see anything in that prayer that said, you know, God, we're so good, you ought to save us. It's not there. It's, it's just not there. Instead, uh, he is, he's saying, uh, save us because of who you are. Save us because you want your name to be broadcast around the world and people to recognize who you are. <clears throat> Let everybody know that you rule in the kingdoms of men. It is interesting 
that the next nation in line is going to be Babylon. And that when, when Nebuchadnezzar gets too proud of himself, what does God teach him? God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he will. That's what he's going to teach him. And so this is the exact same thing that's going on here. God's going to teach that. Uh, so he heard the prayer of Hezekiah and sent his response by the hands of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, look at Psalm 46. Uh, the, uh, it was interesting to me that uh, Daniel Whitworth pointed to this and said when his son died at age two, uh, possibly of, of uh, what's called sib, sudden infant death, at any rate, they don't know why. But here's what he said. He read over and over again, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And that's a, that's a pretty, pretty good uh, idea about what happens here. Jerusalem is pictured by Isaiah as he relates the words of God, uh, pictured as, uh, as basically a, uh, a virgin daughter disdaining a suitor. You know, I wouldn't date you if you're the last guy on earth. <laughs> it, kind of that idea is what's going on there as, as he goes forward here. Sennacherib was foolish to think that if he'd been mighty enough to subdue foreign powers like Phoenicia and Egypt, if he descended Lebanon's mountains and dried up the Nile in Egypt, then a backward podunk town like Jerusalem would be no match for him but to mess with Zion was to mess with her God. And that's what Hezekiah underscored. They're mocking you. Not they're mocking us. I mean, Israel may, or Judah may, may well have deserved it in certain senses, but God doesn't. And that's, that's the message. God's going to deal with it. God is omniscient. That means all-knowing. He's also all-seeing. And, and as such, he is the one who's mapped out the plan of history, including Sennacherib's defeat. And that's the message that Isaiah delivers. God's got all this in hand. Now, if this doesn't remind you of Habakkuk, you need to go back and reread Habakkuk. You know, because Habakkuk did, couldn't see how God's going to handle everything. And he asked God, you know, why are you tolerating all this bad going on here? In, in the land of, of your people. And God's answer is, don't worry about it. I've got it under control. I'm sending Babylon. <laughs> and, and Habakkuk basically says, well, Lord, you know, Babylon is worse than we are. <laughs> you know? And, uh, <clears throat> and God, God's answer to that is, I got that in control too. I'm going to destroy them. So you look at how he looks at history at, uh, in advance. You know, we, we see history looking backwards, and we can see it if we choose to do the homework, we can see it pretty perfectly. We, we can see what we know about it. God looks into the future, and He sees it perfectly. He reads it like a map, just like it's a book of history. And that's what you see uh, really here in what the, the prophet is having to say. Now, Judah's food supply had been devastated by Sennacherib's uh, tear through the countryside, it would be spared, uh, would be sparse for two years, but would recover by the third year. Now that, that's kind of a subtle message, isn't it? Things are bad right now, and they're going to be bad for a little while, but in the third year, everything's going back to normal. Now, brethren, I want us to think about our troubles. Do we need to look down the road and say, there's a year coming, it's going to be all right? Maybe not today. Don't know about today. But in the future, be okay. That's what uh, really Hezekiah learns. Sennacherib would not enter Jerusalem, uh, Isaiah says, uh, speaking for God. Nor would they bring a siege weapon against it. They wouldn't even build up the, fir the ramparts to try to, to, to break into the city. Rather... The divine warrior, that would be God, would defend Jerusalem, notice, for my own sake and the sake of my servant David. That's a direct quote from verse 34. Please notice, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake 
and for my servant David's sake. What's that about? Well, number one, Hezekiah said, show them who you are. Teach them that your name is a powerful name. Number one, God says, I'm going to do it. Number two, God never forgets his promises. It's very important to remember that. He never forgets a promise. He promised David that he would always have somebody on the throne ruling. And that's going to be fulfilled later at the end of this kingdom. It's going to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. I understand that. But, but that's what we're looking down the road and seeing. What happened? That very night, 185,000 Assyrian warriors were killed by God's messenger. An angel. Uh, that is, is uh, potent. How potent is it? Well, he's going, uh, Sennacherib's going to die for it. <laughs> you lost the whole army. <laughs> to who? <laughs> well, to nobody. Uh, in the sense of human beings. But to the mighty God of heaven, yes. That's who you lost to. And you're going to pay for it again. 20 years later, in January of 681, the narrator informs us while worshiping in the temple of his god, Nishrach, Sennacherib's two sons assassinated him and fled in exile to Ararat, which is modern-day Armenia. All right, chapter 20 enters into Hezekiah's illness. Uh, Hezekiah's illness is merely assigned in a general manner to the same time as the events previously described. Look at verse 1 of chapter 20. In those days. What days? What have we been talking about? We've been talking about when Sennacherib and Assyria came up against Israel, or Judah in this case. That's what we've been talking about. So in a general sense, the author of Kings says, it was during that same time frame the Hezekiah got sick. Keep that in your mind. I've already mentioned it. Keep it in mind because it makes a difference. Uh, at the commencement of the invasion of Sennacherib, that is in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, it is evident from verse 6 here that that is the case. Uh, how do we know? Namely, from both the fact that in answer to his prayer, 15 years more of life were promised him and that he nevertheless reigned only 29 years. So 29 minus 15 is what? It, it, it used to be 14. I, I don't know about modern math, but it used, used to be 14. So this is the 14th year of his reign. And then uh, Kyle goes on to say, and also from the fact that God promised to deliver him out of the hand of the Assyrians and to defend Jerusalem. So where are we in time? We're not at the point where they've been defeated. See, there's a problem reading the biblical text. Uh, because the writer's giving us, uh, he'll track a certain line all the way through. And then he may go back and look at something else. How many times have we seen that? Where he would mention a king in Judah, and then he'd, say, then he'd go back and say, now, during that time, this king was in Israel, and this king was in Israel. See, so he goes back and forth all the time. That's what he's doing here. So please put chapter 20 in the right spot in your mind. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to understand Hezekiah. And, and in some ways, we're going to be unfair to him, I think, uh, in what really happens here. Uh, so <clears throat> he is sick. In verse 2, he turned his face uh, toward the wall. Uh, why? Well, because in verse 1... Uh, Isaiah had said, "Put he set your house in order, for you shall die and not live." Now, Kyle says the word "order" is literally a to command or order with regard to thy house, not declare thy last will to thy family. He's not telling him, uh, "You better be sure you got a good good will in effect, because you're about to die." No, no, no. What he's saying is, you better get things organized in the country so that when you die, it, somebody takes over. That's the idea. Set the order of the country is the idea. Well, <clears throat> Hezekiah is, is uh, I'm going to use an interesting word, I think. He's embarrassed. 
Now, why is he embarrassed? Because uh, he's not even going to live to the age of 40. And furthermore, he doesn't have a son to take his place. Both of those things in Israel, or Judah in this case, both of those things are considered to be, well, it's like a, a smear on your reputation. He died young, and he didn't even leave a son. See, you can almost hear the, uh, the dripping sarcasm from people if they heard about this. So, Hezekiah turns to the wall. What does that mean? Uh, I like uh, what Winters said about it uh, in his uh, little commentary. He said, the wall was Hezekiah's secret closet. Uh, you think about, uh, think about this now. If you go to Matthew chapter 6, to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, God says what? He says, don't go, don't go, and, and uh, pray your prayers, you know, so everybody can hear them. But go to the closet. Because God's going to hear you in the closet. Hezekiah turns to the wall. When he turns to the wall, in a, in a certain sense, what he's doing is, He's blocking everybody else out. It's just me and God right now. So Hezekiah is going to turn to the wall, and, and he literally lays his soul bare. So let's pick up on that. That's at verse 2 of uh, this 20th chapter. He turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I've walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Hezekiah is saying, look, God, I've, I've lived a righteous life. I've done your will. And he is, he's just bitter about dying uh, under these circumstances. Again, young, no son. We've got to keep that kind of in the back of our minds as we look at this uh, and, and read about it. <clears throat> so, it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, all right, first of all, middle court. Uh, <clears throat> the middle court uh, was, was the place between the palace and the temple. So he's barely out of the palace when God says, you've got to go back. Now, I, I didn't notice this, but I don't want to pass over it. I gave you some verses from... Deuteronomy, Michael Whitworth brought these in. Hezekiah's petition is short, and yet he uses words that come from Deuteronomy 8, 10, 11, 19, 26, 28, and 30. And what do those words basically say? If you do what's right, I'm going to take care of you. Hezekiah, in his prayer, is basically saying, I I've been doing what was right. He thought he was. Now, there may have been a problem, but he, he, he looks like he's open to God. You tell me what's wrong here. Uh, because I'm dying, and I don't understand why, is, is what I see there uh, as he prays. So, does God hear him? Yes. And Isaiah is told this, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. Now, reemphasize. Remember, why is he going to deliver them? Partly because of David. Okay? And Hezekiah, for the most part, has acted like David. So just, just notice that. I have heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Surely I'll heal you. On the third day, you should go up to the house of the Lord. When are you going to get well? It's not going to be long. How do you know? Because on the third day, you're going to be able to go to the house of the Lord. That's, that's what he says. And I'll add to your days 15 years, and I will, we've already seen this, deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Now please, now notice where we are then, right? We're in a, we're in a point in time they're not delivered yet. See, if you end chapter 19, you say, well, they're delivered. Well, they are. Because he's gone through the story. But remember... It, Jewish writers tend to write an overview, and then they come back and give you more specifics. 
Think chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. Overview of creation, chapter 1. Specifics in chapter 2 about the creation of man. You see that? See the way that works? Okay. Very, very important to notice that as, as we go through here because this is, this is backing up and giving us details we didn't have before. Then Isaiah said, uh, take a lump of figs. So they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered. Now, I, here's why I'm going to, my only response I've got to that. That is that I, I am fully a believer that God can work and he can work through doctors. Now, I didn't, there's some doctors I've not been convinced he's working through them, but, but, uh, but he can. And we, we, we offer up prayers for somebody that's in the hospital. Like, let's say Sarah Broom is an example. What we're asking is God work through the doctors and the nurses. So this poultice is not what saves his life. It's God. That's who saves his life. Uh, but the poultice is, is basically, it is a known, by the way, check it historically, that is a known treatment in that era. I, I don't know if Shonda's ever used that, but, uh, but it was used back then. <laughs> and, uh, and did it work? Well, yeah, because God made it work. It's the same thing as, does the medicine work? Well, if God makes it work, it'll work. Uh, I believe it's the answer. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? Now, if you back up, you may remember a different king uh, who, who had a different approach altogether. In Isaiah chapter 7, when God says this is what's going to happen, uh, Isaiah says, uh, ask for a sign and God will give it to you. And the king said, no, not going to ask for any signs. Uh-uh. And, of course, it's then that he gives the prophecy about the, the virgin that's going to, going to bear a son. That's where the prophecy about the coming of Jesus is to be found. But he didn't ask for it. His, but what about Hezekiah? Oh, Hezekiah asked for a sign. And so here's what happens. Then Isaiah said, this is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go backward 10 degrees? All right, shadow. How did they tell time? They did not look at their Apple Watch or whatever in the world you're wearing right now. They didn't look at that. They didn't have one. They didn't have watches on their hands at all. How did they tell time? They told it by the sun. They had a sundial. Okay, so God's question is, you want time to go forward or backward? And Isaiah's answer, or excuse me, Hezekiah's answer is interesting. Hezekiah answers, it's an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. Let time reverse is the idea. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. How did that happen? My absolute, beyond a shadow of doubt, uncontrovertible answer is, I do not know. I've read a lot of things. The only thing I can tell you is this. God did it. Can God do it? Can He choose to do it whatever way He chooses to do it? The answer to that is yes. How did he do it? Don't know. If you want to put that on your list to ask and get to heaven, it's fine with me, you know, because, because I can't give you an answer. I just know it went backwards. Did it go backwards over the whole world? I don't know that. You know, that means basically not only did the earth stand still if he did it that way, not only did it stand still, it actually reversed its rotation. You know, is that the way God did it? Well, he could have. He's the creator. He's got the ability but did he do it that way? I don't know. See, I'm just telling you, he did it. Okay, that's the point. And it's what we must see. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, now we get into that part that's, that people have a problem with uh, a, a little bit. So you've got uh, uh, representatives of the Babylonian king come with letters following Hezekiah's recovery. 
And he shows them everything in his house and realm, including the money and valuable spices. Now look, we don't put a lot of, a lot of uh, into this. We, most people don't know anything about spices. But let me give you an example. A little bitty bottle of, uh, of frankincense, which is one of the things they brought to, when Jesus was born. A little bottle of frankincense. Uh, weigh about 15 milliliters will cost upwards of a hundred dollars if it's if it's put, if it's done right. Upwards of a hundred dollars. Uh, if I remember right, Hella Christmas higher than that, and some others uh, that that you might talk about. So when you talk about he the spices, he's showing them that that's like gold in the bank because spices is part of how, what they used for medical treatment back in those days. So very, very valuable. He shows all that. Now, 2 Chronicles 32 seems to indicate it was from pride that he did this. Uh, Isaiah came and told Hezekiah that Babylon one day would carry away the nation of Judah into captivity. Hezekiah does not respond the way he had to his illness by turning the wall and praying to God uh, but the visit of the Babylonians precedes Sennacherib's invasion. We ought to interpret Hezekiah's response as humble submission to the divine will and gratitude that Jerusalem would not be destroyed immediately. Look, he's under, he's under pressure from the Assyrian army. And so when he says, well, I'm, I'm glad they're not going to win in my day, that's a different view than the other way of looking at it. Uh, that, that I've always looked at it. So you take it for what it's worth and, and see what you come up with. Chapter, uh, the end of chapter 20, Hezekiah dies. Manasseh begins his reign. Now there is an observation that is made about Hezekiah, a reference to his tunnel. That tunnel was found in the 1800s. Uh, it is 1,800 feet long. It redirected the flow of the Gihon Spring, which is outside the city walls, to the west side of Jerusalem and inside the walls into the Pool of Siloam. You ever heard of that? Yeah, the Lord went to the Pool of Siloam, by the way. Uh, providing the city with another water source inside and denying one to the invaders outside the walls. So he mentions that. Chapter 21 begins with Manasseh. Uh, Manasseh's reign began at the age of 12. Now, how is that possible? Well, there's only one way I can figure out, and I got it from other people, but it made sense to me. Uh, that likely meant that he shared the throne in his early days with his father as co-regent for the first 10 years. All total, Manasseh reigned 55 years. So 45 of those, he's by himself. 10, he's with his daddy. It looks like. That's, that's the best way, seemingly, uh, to, to view that. All right? Picking up then uh, with verses 2 through 8, uh, we learn terrible things about him. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Notice what, the, what is being said right here by the writer. That is, these sins he's going to commit are the very things that cause God to throw the Canaanites out of the land. And you better believe God is consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Hebrews chapter 13, of course, in reference to Jesus. Verse 3, For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah's father had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal, made a wooden image, uh, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done, and he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. Up to this time, we don't have that. This is the first record of them worshipping the stars and the sun, the moon, and so forth. Uh, but they do it now because of him. He leads them there. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem, I'll put my name. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, also, he made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house 
of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever and will not make the feet of Israel wander any more from the land which I gave to, or I gave their fathers, only if they're careful to do according to all that I have commanded them. We're going to look more at that next week. But uh, he's led them into sin, just like Jeroboam led Israel, and Judah's going to pay just like Israel did. Read the rest of the book. 